Good morning, church family. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> Good morning, church family. Okay, maybe I must go a different language. Dumelang. <laughs> Sunny banani. Goeie mora. <laughs> See, your pastor can speak in different tongues. No, but it's awesome to be in the house this morning. I tried to look. I even said to Mom Mavis, I said, to, I, I was looking at this week for a, I, I hope I'm going to pronounce it correctly. I was looking for umkele. Umkele, yeah, that, that, that one. But, but I thought, no, I, I'm, I don't want to be disrespectful to the, to, to, to the men in this house, you know. So, so I thought, no, let me just, just stay with the normal traditional what I have here in me. And then we keep it from there. And I have Ma Roxy here with me, you know. Mom von this in her attire. So, but yeah, it's awesome to be in the house and see you with all your heritage attire. That's awesome to be here. Um, and we're going to celebrate even afterwards um, our heritage. And we're going to enjoy some bonding and fellowship together. So I'm encouraging you not to rush off. I know we want to celebrate, you know, with our family. But this is also family. And so we're going to have an awesome time together after the service. Some braying, like it was alluded to the kids. So I might go upstairs later on. There's some candy floss and some slushies and stuff. So, but we're going to have a competition even for the, the, the annual Bry Master. So I'm hoping to see that also later on. But we're going to go into God's Word. So I want you to open the Word of God together with me. And we're going into the scripture reading of Mark 4. The, the Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, and I'm going to be start reading from verse 26. It will also be on the screen, but as always, I encourage you to bring your own Bibles and just go from that translation that you have also to just, you know, draw a parallel from that because your translation might have a different wording and meaning in that part of that Scripture. But we're going to go into Mark 4 from verse 26, and it says, Then Jesus said, God's kingdom is like a man who plants seed in the ground. The seed begins to grow. It grows night and day. It doesn't matter whether the man is sleeping or awake. The seed still grows. He doesn't know how it happens. Without any help, the ground produces grain. First the plant grows, then the head, and then all the grain in the head. When the grain is ready, the man cuts it. This is the harvest time. As you know, we are in this time of the greater harvest and explaining about the four fields. And last week we unpacked the parable of the sower sowing seed on the various different grounds. And in our introductory passage this morning, we understand it to be the parable of the growing seed. And as we unpack this, you know, the four fields of evangelism, we spoke about the empty field, we sp spoke about the seeded field, and then we speak about the next field, which is the growing field or the, the sprouting field. But I, I want to just unpack quickly for us because I, I feel the need to just explain this because we, we spoke about it last week, about, and we un unpacked a parable, and this week there's another parable, and it's important for us to understand, first and foremost, what is a parable? A parable is basically a comparison. It means to put one thing alongside another to compare them. Now, in the, the Greek, basically, a parable, there's a word there, and I actually, I, I forgot the word, so I'm not even going to try and translate it. But basically, if you translate it back into English, it means throwing alongside. And I thought it was so interesting because we're talking about the throwing or the, the sowing. But the parable is basically meaning to throw alongside something else, to draw a parallel to something. And someone once said that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But I want to go a step further than that and say that it's an earthly meaning to these parables also because they really affect our lives and how we live here on earth for God. This morning we're looking at the third field of evangelism, like I said, calling the, called the growing field or the sprouting field. But I want to just unpack 
Mark 4 and the first verse, 26. And it says, Then Jesus said, God's kingdom is like a man who plants seed in the ground. Much like last week as we unpacked it about, you know, the, the, the sower or the farmer, he had to get up. He had to go out into the field. This means as people, you and me, children called by God as part of his kingdom, we have to go out into the field and sow the seed. Now, of course, this is also a spiritual language that Jesus is using to explain something to the disciples and the people around him. And just as much as the, the, the previous parables, there's something important that we have to unpack in this about the parable, about the seed, about the field, about the ground. But let's go further, one verse on. Mark 4, 27 says the following, The seed begins to grow. It grows night and day. It doesn't matter whether the man is sleeping or awake. The seed still grows. He doesn't know how it happens. It is inevitable that God's seed will grow when it is received by faith into the heart of the hero. Remember, we spoke right in the beginning of this series. We spoke about the idea of how do we receive? How do faith come into people's lives? How do you receive faith? Can you buy faith? Can you go into the discount store and get faith on special? And we unpacked it and we spoke about this. Even a scripture that actually speaks about this. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by? So it speaks about the seed, the very word of God, grows independently in the heart of the hearer. But in order for faith to be activated in the hearer, he has to hear the gospel. And the way the person or that field, that remember we spoke about the empty field, receives the gospel is by us sowing the seed of the gospel, by going into the field and sowing the seed. That's how faith is being activated in communities. Now, although this parable speaks about, because it speaks about night and day, the farmer goes, he sleeps, he wakes up, he doesn't know how this plant grows, how the seed grows. It speaks about the seed is independent to anything else. But there is some factors in play also. Although the seed grows independently, there is some factors at play. Some contributory factors in play. It grows independently, but it doesn't mean that nothing else affects its growth. Now, first of all, we understand this. That the sower has to first go out and sow the seed. Nothing grows. Let me just say this. Nothing grows if a seed hasn't been sowed. Now, some of you might say, well, what about if somebody falls pregnant? Well, again, close your ears, children, right now. Because this is not mommy and daddy time. Even a seed from a man has to go into a woman in order for that seed to grow. So everything, whether it's animals, whether it's human beings, whether it's plants, a seed has to be planted for something to grow. If you don't seed, if you don't sow, nothing will grow. So something has to be released. A seed has to be released in order for us to see the growth. Now first of all, like I said, the spiritual truth is we have to say that a sower must sow the seed. Is that not so? Okay, five of us got it. Excuse the pun. But in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Paul here is indicating that, they, that though God gave the increase and the seed's growth was independent of anything else because the life is in the seed. There was contributory factors to the seed's growth. The seed had to be planted first, and then it needed to be watered. Paul and Apollos, let me just say this, and I think Paul was almost alluding to this idea when he was speaking to the church in Corinth. They are not saviors. They are not the gospel. 
They are not the Holy Spirit. They are not the source of the power. And let me just say it full-heartedly, they are not God. They are an essence. And you're going to be like, oh, you're in the green right now, what I'm going to say. But they are table waiters. They are table waiters. Let me explain it because I know some of you are like, huh? Table waiters means if any waiter, whether you go to a restaurant or you are a waiter, a waiter brings the food to the table. They are not the chef. They are not the people that's making the food or producing the food. They are literally just taking it from the chef to the table. And that is what Paul and Apollos is doing. They are saying we know the gospel, we receive the gospel, and we're taking it from the chef. And we're taking it to the table to be eaten. So they are table waiters. In essence, and this is my point here, faith is activated when the food of God's word is served. We need to sow the seed. We need evangelists. We need waiters. We need gardeners. We need people who gossip the gospel. <laughs> Yo, I feel I have to unpack that for a while. Because there was far too many amens. Like, we, all, we are people who gossip, but can we just go and change that? If we want to gossip, let's gossip the gospel. It is not enough just to throw the seed out. We need to pray before and after. We need to water the Word of God. Now, interesting enough, the word watered in that passage is the Greek word for potizo. See, I'm teaching you now some heritage here also, some Greek heritage. Potizo, which means to water or to irrigate. It can also be translated to imbibe, which is the context which convey the act of a field becoming soaked or saturated in water. Now, let me just draw an analogy for you, something, you know, now tense for myself, Roxanne. We have this I would say we have this beautiful garden, although Roxanne ripped into that garden and pulled out plants and things that was just overgrown. But now we get to the place where now we're watering it. And now we're fighting. Yes, your pastor and his wife fights. Because now we're fighting about who's watering the garden. Because I like that hose, you know, when you like, you like open it up like that and it goes a big spray, small spray. And you're like, oh, I like this. You know, in the old days when I was a light to you, you had to get the hose pipe and put your finger in there like, Shh. Now you got all these fancy things now where you can just turn it around and you're like, oh, you get the slinky thing where you like pull it and it, and it goes all nice. And now we're fighting over the hose pipe. So now every, you know, every day we're like, okay, I'm watering. No, I'm watering. No, I'm watering. It's my day. And so we're fighting over who's watering the garden. Can I tell you something? We laugh about it, but that's how the passion needs to be activated in us to water in the garden of the community out there. That there's a community out there that needs the watering. And I'm not talking about physical water. I'm talking about the healing water. I'm talking about the profound water that says that I am, you know, God in me is like a living water, a fountain that just wants to spring forth and go out. See, when you, are, when you are a child of God, when you have the Holy Spirit in you, you don't need a host pipe. I just want to say you are the host pipe. Hashtag just saying. You are the host pipe that is watering the community. And let me just say, maybe this is where the water comes out from. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so when we go into the community, remember what I spoke about last week? What do we speak about that community? And so as we water the gardens, let's water the community with the love of God, the grace of God. But let's go on. Let's go one verse past and part of, or let's get to the last part of, let me let, rather start there. Let me get to the last part of Mark 4, 27, which says, he doesn't know how it happens. He doesn't know how 
it happens. This mysterious growth of the kingdom in the heart and life of the people who hear the word, the word is the point of this amazing and beautiful parable. It is mysterious. It's going all around us. We don't understand how communities conceive the growth. Just like this farmer, he goes to sleep at night, he wakes up in the morning, and then he sees how the plant is growing. He doesn't know how it happens. It was just a seed in the ground, but now it's growing. And the same can be said when we plant the seeds in communities. And let me just say this, even in our families, even in our neighborhood, in our workplace, we don't know the seeds that we are planting today, what they will look like in future. We don't know how this works, how God operates in His kingdom. That is the beauty and the mysterious way how God works. We might not actually see the growth when we see people changing their lives. We might not actually see the process the transformative process right in front of us, but it doesn't mean that God is not doing something in that community, in that area, in that field that you planted the seeds. Now, I had to Google this to find out for myself if this is a true story, and it is. A seed of the South American herb, Achira. Now, I've got a picture here of that plant. Achira. Now, a Chirakana plant was taken from a 600-year-old necklace, an ancient Indian necklace. The seed that they took from that necklace, now get this, 600-years-old necklace, they took the seed and planted the seed in the ground. In 1968, it germinated, and it grew to the height of almost two meters, and then eventually flowered and produced fruit. 600 years of being in a necklace, then taking it and putting it in the ground, and now it's producing fruit. Its purpose was not to be on the necklace. Its purpose was to produce fruit. Now, here's the incredible thing that I want you to understand about this story, about this truth about this plant that speaks into our lives. Maybe you've planted a seed. Maybe you've prayed for your child, your son and your daughter. Maybe you've prayed for a loved one, for them to receive Jesus, to get their lives sorted out. Maybe you've prayed for people in your workplace. Maybe you've prayed for your neighborhood. And you're like, you're like me, I know, I know, and we're going to touch on that just now. You're impatient because you pray today and tomorrow you want to see a change. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. I just want to say that. Because sometimes we're not going to actually see the growth straight away. That's why it says the farmer doesn't know. He goes to sleep at night and he wakes up the next morning. And believe me, it doesn't say that, but I can read between the lines. If that farmer was Kali, can I tell you, I'd be like awake at five in the morning and I'll be going to the field. Like. And then the next day I'll go back. And then I'll try to tell myself, I can see something moving. Even if nothing is moving, I can tell myself something is moving. The ground doesn't look the same anymore. And even if there's like a little, little, little thing sticking out, I'm like, woo! Something is coming out. I'll be celebrating. I'll be telling my neighbor, check, something is happening. And my neighbor like, where? Some of our teenagers are like that sometimes. I talk about the boys. And then when they want to go facial hair, I would just think about it. And they're like, look, look, look at my beard. And like, huh? <laughs> now I need to shave that. What? Where? <laughs> Some of us, we, we are like that sometimes. But it's the excitement of the fact that when you do see something happening. And I think that's the excitement that created in that farmer, in that sower. He didn't see what was happening underground. But the moment it broke through the soil, 
he saw life coming through. And maybe sometimes, and I pray it doesn't happen, but maybe it does sometimes happen, that it will take 600 years for something to happen. Maybe it will take you a week. Maybe it will take a month. Maybe a year for your family to receive Jesus. But don't give up. Can I tell you something about this farmer, this sower? In the first week when he didn't see anything happening, he didn't go up and uproot the swell and say, well, nothing is growing here. I'm just going to become a carpenter right now. I fail as a farmer, so I'm just going to be a carpenter right now. He didn't. He went back the next day, watered the garden, and go went to back to bed. Woke up the next day, watered the garden, didn't see any movement, but he didn't give up. And I want to challenge each and every one of us, whether you're a parent, whether you're a family member, whether you're a colleague at work, whether you're a child at school, whether you're somebody in your community, whether you've been praying for months, maybe even years, do not give up. Do not give up. Continue waking up in the next morning. Continue watering that field, saturating it with prayer. Because you don't know how that might change the community by you not giving up on that field. Now I want to leave you with a few things. And to make it easy, we work on the three P's. Firstly, perspective. As workers, farmers, sowers in the field, we need to have perspective. We need to understand it's not about us. It's not about me and it's not about you. It's all about God. It's about the seed. That's where the love is. Life is not in you. The love is in the seed that you are planting, that you are sowing. 1 Corinthians, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 3, but let's go one verse further than 6. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 7. And it says, it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. I said to Rixam when I was preparing this week for this message, and I went through different translations, and do yourself some, a favor and go do some homework in this specific passage, 1 Corinthians 3, 7, it actually says, and I didn't want to be that harsh to us here, but it says, you are nothing. That basically says, you are nothing. Compared to God, you are nothing. You might think that you are something, but if God comes into the equation, you become less, He increases. Many of us, we look at this and we're like, oh, look at me. I planted seeds. Look at my ministry. And that's not about what it's all about. We need perspective. It's not about us or the ministry we run. How well you can speak in tongues. How many people fall on the floor when you pray for them. Yes, you have something to do. But it's not about what we do. It's about what God does. And then the second thing we need to understand, and that's the second P, is the one that we sometimes really battle with, is patience. Yo, we, hate, we hate that word. Mark 4.27 says this, The seed begins to grow. It grows night and day. It doesn't matter whether the man is sleeping or awake. The seed still grows. He doesn't know how it happens. Now just hold your finger on that passage. Just hold your finger there. Then turn with me to Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1 and 2. Because it says, and I'm trying to draw a parallel with this. I'm doing my own parable. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to harvest. That means there's seasons even in harvest time. There's seasons in reaping. There's seasons in sowing. And dare I even say, 
there will be seasons of waiting. And we don't like that season so much. We like it when we are reaping. We like it when we are sowing. But we don't like the waiting season. Because for us, waiting means there's no activity. But just because you cannot see with your natural eyes the activity that is happening underground in the good soil, doesn't mean God is not moving. That the Spirit is not active. You just need to wait. Rest upon Him and know that He's doing something good. Hudson Taylor, the great pioneer missionary to China, said there are three qualifications for a good missionary. Can I tell you those three qualifications? Okay, number one, to be a good missionary, you need patience. Number two, another qualification to be a good missionary, patience. The third qualification, can I tell you the third qualification? Some of you might know this, shout it out. That's what it means to be a good missionary. Patience, patience, patience. That's a qualification for everyone in the work of the Lord. It takes good faith to be a farmer like this man. It takes good patience to be a farmer like this man. And it takes the same faith and patience to be a sower of God's seed. Someone has said that the secret of patience is doing something else in the meantime. This man was sleeping, getting up, at night going to back to bed, doing his day's work. The thing we can do doing while we're waiting and patiently looking for the harvest is to keep sowing, to keep watering. That's our job. Some go a lifetime without seeing much fruit, but God's Word promises that a harvest will come. And then the last P. Remember, we spoke about perspective, we spoke about patience, and the last P that we have to understand is purpose. Mark 4.29 says, When the grain is ready, the man cuts it. This is the harvest time. The seed, the Word of God is sown to bring forth a harvest. That's the reason why the Word of God is sown. The ultimate purpose for the Word of God is that it should be a harvest. To bring glory to God. Now let me just finish with a brief challenge for each and every one of us this morning. We need to be sowing. We need to be watering. But we also need to be waiting. But in this challenge, there's also something that we need to understand. The beauty of this, the beauty of understanding the harvest, the beauty of understanding the growing season is a cause for hope, not for despair. Because the life is in the seed. You might never see the fruits of your planting and watering, but a time will come where there will be a field that you have sown, ready for a greater harvest. And I pray for the day. Can I tell you? I cannot wait for the day when we have sown into a field into a community. We might not even see it in our generation, but your, I pray there will be a generation that will rise up and say, I don't know how this happened, but somebody before me, they had a heritage. On Heritage Day, they went into the field. They planted and sowed some seed into that community. Yes, it was an impoverished community. It was full of crime. Nobody wanted to plant seeds there. But somebody came. And I didn't see it for years. But something is happening in that community. Revival is happening in that community. I don't know what. But somebody murmured. Somebody said there was people that came from sweet waters to this community. I don't know how it happened. But they came. And all of a sudden, we see that community planting more churches, getting more services. And the glory of God, the Spirit of God is moving. And nobody knows how it happens. But God is moving. And Sweetwater has planted that seeds. 
Are you ready, church? Are you ready to set up the next generation? Are you ready to leave a heritage for the next community that will even come after us? Because it's not about just this generation. Not just about me and you here today. It's about future generations. I pray for this place, for Sweetwater's Church, where communities will fluctuate into these doors. Where people say, I don't know how it happened, but these doors are too small. These walls are too narrow. This place is too small. Because communities are just coming. Because seeds were planted and watered and watered and watered and watered. Church, are you ready? Can I ask you to stand this time? <laughs> I feel I need to pray for, for a specific situation also. Because I touched on it early on. Many of us are parents here this morning. Many of us have families. And many of us are struggling with this idea that I came to Jesus and I was excited. I just fell in love with Jesus because I know He saved my life. But there's also a friction. There's a struggle because although you're excited, although you know Jesus and you know Jesus loves you, the moment you're talk, talking to your children about Jesus, it feels like they're just not interested feels like they're just being rebellious. They don't want to, you know, come to church. They don't want to plug into just hearing about, you know, Bible verses. And it's real. This happens. Many parents are struggling with that. Many of us are struggling with family members. I'm talking from people that maybe come from a previous religion. And then a seed was planted in their life. And then they discovered Jesus through that seed but now it's tough because the rest of the family around them don't know Jesus they're still stuck in the previous religion and it's like this war going on the spiritual warfare because you need to, to, to share the gospel to your family but they're not interested they always excommunicate you and it's tough because you have this passion, this fire burning in you to share. And you want to see your family being saved. I don't know if one person that says, I don't want my family being saved. Everybody wants to be saved. Because this is just temporary. As glorious as this is for some people, let me just say, this is just temporary. There's an eternal home that is already being prepared for each and every one of us. And I don't know about you, but I want to see my family all going to heaven one day. I want my family all to know about Jesus. So I want to make sure that I, I, I plant seeds. Whether they're sending a message, whether it's just my life, my own life, where they can see the example of what it means to be a child of God. Parents, I just want to touch there. Parents, sow the seed of just who you are in God. Don't force it. Your character and your nature of who you are as a child of God will start to activate something in your children. But if all they see is you, you, mommy and daddy always fighting, always being just, always, you know, complaining, gossiping, talking foul language, drinking badly, not that there's anything about drinking good. I just had to say that because just now people say, oh, well, there's a thing I can, I can drink good. No, you can't drink good and bad. Just cut it out completely if you can. But your behavior is what your children are going to see. And so teach them in your character and your nature of what it is to be a child of God. For those of your family members, maybe recently you're still fresh in this. You stepped into this new journey, this new life of having Jesus into your heart. But it's a struggle with your family because in a sense, you come here on a Sunday morning and you're just like fueled up and you just feel inspired. And then you go back home and just like there's like this dark cloud. 
It's like everything is still the same. Nothing has changed. And maybe you've been planting seeds even in your home, in your family life. Maybe for some of us, and I say this, maybe for some of us, our spouses that even don't come to to church. Just continue planting the seed. Just continue planting the seed. You don't know when your spouse decides that this is the day that I want to make my life to be for Jesus. Maybe for your family, where they actually say, no longer will I follow idols, worship different gods, but I will worship the only living God. And it will be a seed that you have planted in their life. Don't give up. Please don't give up. You might not see the seed growing, germinate, but if it can happen with a 600-year-old seed and a necklace, can I tell you how much more will happen with you planting spiritual seeds into your family and your community? Can I ask you just to lift your hands this morning as we pray for various situations and people in this area? Well, I pray, Lord God, that we would receive perspective to understand, Lord God, it's not about us, it's all about you, King Jesus. It's not about our ministries and the things that we put titles behind it, Lord God, programs, events behind it, Lord God. It's all about you, King Jesus. It always has been. It will always will be about you, King Jesus. Help us to have perspective over this. When pride starts to come in and linger in, Lord, that we will cut it at the very root, Lord God. To know, Lord God, that it's not about us. Yes, you will use us, Lord. Let us be table waiters, Lord God, to serve the food, Lord God, to the community, Lord, out large, Lord. But, Lord, also stir within us to have patience, Lord. To have perseverance and patience, Lord God. To know there's going to be times where we are planting, Lord God. But it's also going to be a time and a season of waiting, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that we would wait, Lord God, with eager anticipation, Lord God, for the harvest to come in. Because your word will not return void. And we thank you, Lord God, as we plant the seed of your word, we thank you, Lord God, there is already a future harvest that is being lined up, Lord God. But Lord, let us also understand the purpose behind this. Lord, let us understand that there is a purpose for us to plant the seed, to sow the seed, to water the seed, Lord God. Because for everything, there has to be a purpose. And the purpose of sowing the seed is to glorify our great King and for many people to receive you in their hearts. We love you, King Jesus. We love you, King Jesus. Right now, if you're a parent, if you're a family member that you know in your situation, I'm not asking you to lift your hands or anything like this. I'm not asking you to do anything, even to come to the front. All I want you to do is just listen to this prayer. Just acknowledge this prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord God, for each and every family member, child of God, that has dedicated their lives to you, Lord God. Lord, you've stirred within them already a passion for you, Lord God. But there is a fight. There is a war going on, Lord God, where they're fighting for their spouses. They're fighting for their children. They're fighting for their family, Lord God. And it feels tired sometimes. It feels that they want to give up, Lord God. But I pray, Lord God, right now this morning, Lord God, for each and every person in that particular situation, Lord, that you would restore to them, renew them, great health, patience, perseverance, Lord God. Renew the energy, Lord God, to stir within them, Lord God. New vigor, Lord God. A passion unto you, Lord God, that they would continue planting seeds, continue watering that field. Doesn't matter if they don't see any progress, Lord God. They will never give up. And I pray this morning, Lord God, for those who are already at the brink of giving up, Lord, that this word, even this morning, will be found in good soil. That they will just receive the nurturing and the care, the supplements of your goodness into their lives. We worship you. We adore you. King of kings and Lord of lords.
Amen and Amen.